Hi, my name is David Bowes. I am the Communications and Marketing Director for Washington Policy Center, and this is another episode of Washington Policy on the Go. Thanks so much for joining us. We had to take a week's vacation or so as uh, we embarked on our annual uh, uh, annual dinner in Eastern Washington. We had uh, the former Congresswoman and presidential candidate Tulsi Gabbard speak as a keynote, also acclaimed historian and author Victor Davis Hanson. Uh, the event was widely attended. Uh, we had uh, about a thousand people show up in Eastern Washington at the Spokane Davenport Grand. Um, the event was just uh, packed and had a lot of excitement there um, in Eastern Washington. Really a, a great send off for our longtime friend, Chris Cargill, who was our uh, Eastern Washington director, uh, who's moved on to other things and uh, and Washington Policy Center's expansion in, in Western Washington and Eastern Washington and across the state as, as we renovate how we do things and, and we push new envelopes. We'll have a big announcement later this week. I'm not gonna spoil it now, but you'll be seeing a lot more things from Washington Policy Center over the next, uh, well, over the next couple of days, but also over the next few months. So um, get ready for some, uh, some uh, big uh, issue campaigns from Washington Policy Center. And, uh, and also we're looking forward to uh, being more regular now with our Washington policy on the go. Um, just giving people some time to join, I wanna remind you that we changed the format a little bit for Washington uh, policy on the go. Instead of reserving Q&A for the end, uh, if you have a question at any time, bring it up right away because when I'm done speaking to one center director, I just let them go. Uh, we'll incorporate those questions from you in the initial conversation, we don't wait for the end anymore. So if you have any questions, be sure to put them in the Q&A function in Zoom. It should be at the bottom of your screen, maybe at the side, depending on how you have it configured. Uh, but we'll, we'll get to those questions as many as we can before we let that particular Senate director go, and then we'll move on to the next one. Um, again, thank you all for joining us. We'll have this episode available on YouTube. So if you have to bow out early, or if you miss something, you wanna see it again, uh, give us about 24 to 48 hours, and you'll see it on our YouTube channel and I hope you'll share it with some friends as well. All right, first I wanna to turn uh, to our Center for Small Business Director, Mark Harmsworth, who has a couple of different blogs out um, regarding some of both a Washington uh, kind of spreading bad influence and bad influence spreading into Washington state from other places. We'll start with uh, what we're doing in terms of inspiring um, some uh, regulation in other states, specifically in California and New York, uh, following what Mark calls job killing, job killing salary legislation. Uh, Mark, uh, welcome. And what is the job killing salary legislation that Washington is, is spreading to other states? Uh, thanks for having me on, uh, David. The, uh, the, the Senate bill uh, we passed as a state, uh, which is uh, 5761, um, requires employers to post salary ranges with jobs. So you imagine that you put your job out there for, say, a, uh, a, a administrative assistant or something, and now you have to paste your salary range, which on the surface sounds, hey, well, that's great, because that really sets the expectation for the, uh, the, the applicant that they can kind of see where they're at, and, uh, and they don't apply for jobs that they shouldn't, unless maybe it's above or below where they were targeting. The problem is, though, um, the applicant has the ability, if they're not hired and they find out that someone else got the job outside of that range, that they can now sue the employer during the hiring process. The other thing that it introduces is um, a, a problem with an employer that maybe gets a great candidate in that doesn't quite have all the skills they really need yet, and the employer wants to hire them maybe at a lower level and make them a, an intern or, or trainee employee for a period of time before they bump them up to the full salary because they think they'd be a great fit for the team. And on the other end of the scale, you may have someone who applies and you want to offer more because they're a great employee in today's market. You know, we have to be very competitive. Sometimes your ad's out there for a while before you get somebody in and you may want to offer them more with this new policy you can't do that now you have to offer within the range additionally day one on the job you show up 
let's say the salary range is $40,000 to $60,000 a year and you get offered 50. Well, now you know that you were 10,000 short of the 60. So how does that make you feel when you start work on the first day? It makes you feel devalued as an employee. So it creates a, a lot of different issues. And also with existing employees that may be joined many years earlier, that salaries are catching up. They may only be six months behind, but suddenly they look at it and go, well, I should just quit and reapply for the job and maybe I'll get more money. So it creates all sorts of problems. It really inhibits the, uh, the flexibility of hiring and it ultimately destroys jobs. The employers have a very easy way around this. Your salary range is now one to one million dollars and it just confuses the whole market. So uh, you can see this was a piece of legislation looking for a problem that did not need to be solved. And uh, apparently it solved it. Now, New York and California. No, wait, wait. There was two just questions. as bad as the rest. Huh? There, there was two questions I had there based on this, yeah. this which was, you know, I, I mean, I, you basically answered them both right there. But one is, why was this considered a problem to begin with? I mean, who brought this up and what, what were they saying was the actual problem with not having the salary, you know, defined in these in, for these jobs? Um, and then the other question was, is there any restrictions on what the range can be? Because like you say, if you can put one to a million, you know, all this does is it creates more paperwork for a company, but it's not actually doing anything. And I, I would expect that if this is really something that a legislator thought was a real problem, they would come back and limit those ranges, you know, instead of saying, hey, you can get around this with one to one and a, one to one million or one to, two, to you know, a billion. Right. Um, they'll just start saying, well, it has to be within 10% you know, or something. So, right. Uh, well, it was Senator Randall that introduced the legislation. So I'm not sure exactly what the thought process was around uh, how that happened. Um, but obviously the range thing I just mentioned, it, it's just such a simple way to get around the legislation. And it's legislators not really understanding how the job market works and, and how you, you go through the hiring process um, and, and just opening it up for litigation. So there's two folks to answer you, sort of the first part of your question there. And there's two sets of folks I think would be interested in this. Obviously, from an applicant perspective, it gives you a range, which again, as I mentioned at the beginning, it sort of feels like, oh, okay, well, this is a good idea, but you can see the implications of it are not as good. But if you're a, um, a fixed rate, like a union shop that's on prevailing wage, or you're bidding contracts, you don't have any visibility into private industry. And so a union can use this now to argue for uh, collective bargaining and during that collective bargaining to increase rates to match private industry or vice versa, where that they realize they're being overpaid for things. So they have a particular interest, but on the, and then the other thing is the applicants just fire you, uh, find yourself the ambulance chasing trial lawyer to go after an employer because you know, the guy that won the job got $50,001 instead of 50,000 and you didn't. So, and, and that also means that you may get hired, but someone else gets hired inside the range. You may sue as an employee of the same company. So you, you, the, all the litigation issues, it's sort of a bit like the key tam bill or the bounty hunter bill that we saw this year, thankfully didn't go anywhere, uh, where you could sue on behalf of other employees. This just opens up more lawsuits. And at the end of the day, it increases liability insurance on employers, which means less money, which means less ability to offer their employees uh, salary increases in today's market. That's you know, it's really competitive. So you you want to hire the best you can, and most employers will pay as much as they can realistically afford to get the best employees they can. And so this again, it's just unnecessary legislation. And that would also be restrictions on creativity too, because you know, like you mentioned before, a lot of times in hiring process, you're hiring for one job, and when you're going through and talking with people, you learn, hey, wait a second. You know, there's a better way to do this, or mm -hmm. this employee could actually help me over here a lot more. Maybe we could make do over here, but you're not going to have the flexibility of, uh, you, I mean, right. you'd have to write up a whole new job posting yep. and start over before you're allowed to actually make those moves. Right. And what if you decided, you know, maybe part-time, maybe this isn't a full-time gig. Let's reevaluate this and make it a part-time where you're certainly going to be below the range at that point, And suddenly you're in violation of the state law. So uh, I think you'll see employers put overly broad ranges on jobs now, which will just basically put us back where we were in the first place, which was just fine.
question from Martin. Does the salary definition requirement apply to all employers or only to employers of a certain size? It's a certain size. I forget the exact cutoff, um, but yeah, that's yeah, you're you're accurate there. Is there a required time frame from the higher end date until you can offer the employee a raise? Like, uh, could no, you? No, not that I'm aware of. I, I think. Uh, uh, you could do it immediately if you wanted to, which would kind of sort of somewhat circumvent a, a lawsuit that had been filed. Um, but again, that's discretionary on the employer. So most employees are hired on a you know a preliminary basis or a, a, a ninety day prove yourself basis anyway. Yeah. Um, so and where they get bumped up at the end of ninety days. Uh, isn't this what happens when we don't elect business owners? Asked Joe. <laughs> Absolutely. I'm a business owner, as you might know. And uh, this is extremely frustrating for me. It's like, uh, you know, I get all sorts of folks come to me and say, hey, you got any work? So what am I supposed to now do? Say, oh, you can't come work for me because I need to post a job ad. Make sure it's out there. Make sure the range is on there. Then you can come talk to me. And I, it's a complete nightmare. So California and New York are jumping on this bandwagon. Um, yep. You know, I, it's it strikes me as the kind of thing that they might find very popular with with uh, less pushback, because it's hard to you have to explain it in multiple steps to people, you know, as to why this is not the greatest idea. But you know, I mean, it, it's almost like if you did the reverse and you mandated that people say what their what their salary expectations were, you know, and and limited their negotiating skills, because I've known people who've walked into jobs thinking, you know, what I'm going to go for fifty thousand, you know, and then they walk out going. Uh, they offered me 80,000. I couldn't, couldn't believe it, you know? Yeah. And so, you know, that it, it's, that's not helpful on that side either. Right. Um, and, and then you, you also see, as they always say, the first person to make the offer is always on the losing side. Well, in a current situation, the employer has to make that first offer. Yeah. And so the employee then has the ability to counter on that as well. And, you know, as you, you if you're applying for jobs that are way above your station, I mean, you're going to figure that out during the interview process because they're going to be asking you questions. You have no clue how to answer um, and vice versa. If they start saying, so, uh, Mr. CEO of so-and-so, how are you doing at, good at cleaning tables? No disrespect to our fine establishment restaurant workers, but you're good at clean tables, you're going to know pretty quickly that that's, oh, I think I've applied for the wrong job. I thought this was a restaurant manager rather than, you know, a, a, a bus bus person, you know, a, a restaurant assistant. So you know, it'll work out. California, New York, I think um, down there, there's a lot of angst, particularly in California around some of the gig workers, uh, Uber and Lyft and DoorDash, who, uh, you know, they've been working uh, hard the unions have down there to uh, create w2 employees we're seeing that here in seattle now as well um, which removes flexibility from those positions and i suspect that um, if you think uber and lyft now have to post salary ranges which is incredibly hard for them because it's going to come down to how many hours you work right. so th there's all sorts of horrible problems and and uh, unintended well maybe there were intended consequences to this piece of legislation that's what I was trying to think of is, is what's the step two? Because it seems like a strange, a strange obsession. Like you say, where was the problem to begin with? I mean, why the sudden interest in interfering in negotiations between everybody in every single job interview? Um, and then I, I then I'm, I'm asking myself, well, you know, what's what's step two? What, what does this set the stage for for the next next round? And maybe you've hit on to a bit there where it's aimed at certain industries or certain um certain aspects of industries to, to uh, uh, limit that growth or, or even reduce it um, I, as a possibility. I, I think it also sets sort of standard wage categories too. So rather than, you know, you may have a superstar that you want to work for you who just wants to do X, Y, Z, and is quite happy doing that. Um, and you want to pay them well and because they're a great employee. But if, you know, this, what this is going to start forcing people to do is standardize salary ranges per job type, um, which is very similar to obviously a unionized structure. You think of a SPIA up at Boeing and some of the you know, IEBW and, and some of these guys on how they structure their salaries and levels. And it seems like, hey, I can go get myself an extra 32 cents point one, 31.2 cents per hour. Rather than being rewarded for your performance, for your um, interaction with the team, and your delivery on your on your product that you do as an employee or your service, um, there's no flexibility there anymore. So it sort of flattens everybody out, and um, it's this whole uh, equality thing as well. It's it's like I want to reward my best employees the best I can, and hire the best I can, and and have them do the best job they can, and for them to enjoy it. 
Um, and with this type of thing, it, it just adds a whole bunch of restrictions to me. So just California, New York, or do you see this spilling over elsewhere already? Um, I think you'll see this, uh, the usual suspects, California, New York, uh, some of the more uh, left-leaning states on the East Coast will certainly do that. I wouldn't be surprised if Oregon follows suit soon as they start introducing this legislation, but it's, it's not going to work. So we'll see. We'll see how it plays out. Okay, so the next blog that you wrote about recently was uh, the, regarding the governor and some comments that he made. He was uh, on a trip and, and he pointed out that uh, the permitting process in Washington state is slowing down uh, the likelihood of European investment. You know, explain what the challenges with our permitting process is and what he meant by that. And I guess some of the irony of the governor is observing this. Yeah, so when the uh, permitting process is slow and it helps the agenda, it's a great process and there aren't any problems. But now it's in the way of the governor's green agenda, you know, bringing in uh, this particular company is out of Finland. They're trying to come here and produce uh, batteries, which is great. Um, and we want to see that. But they literally have said, we're not sure you want to come because your permit process is so cumbersome that uh, we don't want to make that investment in Washington state. We'd rather go somewhere that we don't have this permit. So suddenly, you know, the governor's on board with uh, now reducing that barrier and getting rid of some of those permits. So a lot of the permits are particularly around uh, construction. Um, you see this. Uh, I mean, I've just looked at a permit I had to pay for this morning. I've now paid $400 for uh, propane site assessment. So this is placing a propane tank that has to be assessed by somebody on the property for um, for whatever reason. And you know, $400. First of all, there's a permit fee with that. But ignoring that, it took three months to get the permit. I mean, that really slows things down. So if you're a company that's having to invest in building maybe a, you know, a specialized facility like this uh, Finnish company is, they're going to have to build manufacturing facility. Maybe it's in eastern Washington. I don't know where they're planning on doing it. Uh, hopefully where there's a cheap and abundant power, which would be you know somewhere like Moses Lake or somewhere like that. Uh, Quincy, maybe where the data centers are. But you know they're building specialized equipment. So they've got capital investment that has to be put into this facility. And they're holding that note until they can start production and then start recouping some of their cap costs up front. The longer the permit process, the more difficult it is to get through, the more money they lose on that investment or the less, or they don't make money on that investment. They can't ship product, they can't ship services. And so they literally look at it, it's, it's a numbers game. It's, well, we, we, excuse me, we start the factory on day one and at day 200 in Washington, we can open the doors and start shipping product. And that's going to cost us, say, a million dollars a day. So it costs us $2 million in potential lost revenue. You can do the same thing in, in let's pick a random state. And, and then I, don't, I don't know what the permitting is like there, but in Idaho, where maybe you could get it done in 100 days. So you're literally looking at a delta of 100 days and maybe a million dollars a day in lost revenue. That's $100 million, which might be the cost of the factory. So when you look at it from that perspective, um, each state becomes literally a, a, a cost. You can draw a table up. It's really simple. How much is it going to cost to get through this permitting process and, and start selling products? And so when a company doesn't have to geographically locate because of a particular resource or market they want to be in, they can put it wherever they want. And typically that's a, a state without an income tax, which we are right now, which is why I think they're considering us. And secondly, a state that's got a streamlined permitting process uh, that will enable them to deploy their factory much faster. Well, and it, it's also a reminder that we should be looking at these things across the board. I mean, at, on a, every level. Um, I remember the speech that was given, a keynote address at, uh, at a Washington Policy Center annual dinner by Mitch Daniels, former governor of Indiana, talking about the need to change permitting and licensing processes and how, you know, not only did he speed things up, but he reduced the cost. I think of our own highway system where, you know, we want to we want to build you know, a highway and we've got environmental uh, permitting in the middle of urban areas uh, that are that are delaying projects for years at a time, you know, and, and it just, it makes no, it, it, you know, it's, it's not like a sanctuary for, <laughs> you know, uh, eagles and, and other migratory birds. I mean, it's just, it's basically cityscape. So um, there's a lot of strange, strange things happening in the permitting process uh, mm. there that would speed things along. Do you see uh, the governor maybe reaching out to Washington Policy Center and saying, hey, 
I need to speed up this uh, permitting process. What do I do? Well, my number's on the internet. I'll be happy to chat to him and give some great suggestions. And I'm pleased, on a, I'm truly pleased that he's actually considering this because this doesn't just affect uh, this particular industry segment. It affects all our businesses. And, you know, if if the, the governor decides that he wants to streamline the processes, we'll do everything we can to help and make that, make that a reality. Yeah, you bring up a good point, which is, you know, sometimes you won't listen to certain people because you don't like them, you know, I mean, and or you just think, hey, that that group is, uh, you know, they're opposed to me, therefore I'm not going to listen to them. It's part of the who's uh, who's to say uh, problem that we have in civil debate in, in this society, where you know, instead of listening to what's being said, we judge things by who is saying them. Now, obviously, sometimes it's a good guidepost because you get used to certain people lying about things all the time or whatever. You can you can dismiss, you know, you, you're they're they're not going to raise your concerns, so to speak, but. Um, just because you know one person says it or one group says it doesn't necessarily mean that it's bad or that it's uh, that it's not worth considering. And so, by having this other organization, this company, come and tell the governor, "Hey, there's a problem here," and getting him to finally listen to that, you know, if that's what it takes, you know, a Finnish uh, company to tell him we've got a permitting problem in Washington, that's uh, that's good news. Maybe yeah. we'll have some some real change here. Mark, yeah. thanks a lot uh, for being you on bet. the Washington Policy on the Go. Appreciate it. You bet. You bet. Now let's bring on uh, Todd Myers. He is our Center for the Environment Director, and uh, he's also been taking on a number of, of issues. He just had a column published in the Spokesman Review um, about those who claim climate spending is good can't explain why. Let's start with that, Todd, because uh, I, I know you know that was a it was a great column. I thought, um, and one of the things you're pointing out is that that people see a big climate bill. And I've said this a million times, but it always uh, politics so often reminds me of the British comedy series, Yes, Prime Minister, where there's there's an episode devoted to this idea of saving a bunch of money by not buying a new missile system that didn't actually work anyway. But the whole debate behind the scenes was, well, we can't we can't do this because if we cancel this, we won't have the best. And they said, yeah, but it doesn't work. And they said, well, the best is the most expensive. So it doesn't matter if it works. What matters is do people feel it's, uh, it, it's, it's good? And if we spend the most money on it, then everyone's going to be convinced that it's the shiny, the new, the most wonderful thing because it's the most expensive. And, and your column kind of tackles that same subject, which is, you know, is something the best because it's expensive or are there other metrics that we should be considering? Uh, go ahead and explain Todd. Well, the particular, there was a, several examples that I cited. The one that sort of made me shake my head was, is the most recent spending package um, by Congress, which included all sorts of climate spending. Um, and one local Washington state uh, editorial board said, this is the lar- this is great because it's the largest climate spending package ever. That was all they said about why they liked it. It was the biggest. They didn't say, look, it's gonna do this and here's the metrics. I mean, none of that. Does it work? I don't know, it's the biggest. And I see lots and lots of that. Um, And there was another example uh, from Vancouver. Um, So Vancouver, Washington wants to pass a $9 million a year climate action package to do all sorts of different things, transit and other things like that. And they had an estimate about how much CO2 it would reduce. And normally I dig into that, but I said, okay, so for this $9 million, how much are you getting? And they said, well, we're reducing the harm done by climate change by $13 million a year. And I said, okay, so who gets that $13 million? And they and the staff said, oh, that goes to the people of Vancouver. And I said, no. Look at your own source. What your source says is that because climate change is a global problem, meaning that more CO2 impacts everyone across the globe, that $13 million you've calculated is for everyone across the planet, not just Vancouver. And if you prorate the benefit to Vancouver based on just population, which you know is as good a way as any, I suppose, uh, you get $300. So for $9 million, spent, you get $300 of benefit to the people of Vancouver. But again, it's like they, the, they have these metrics that they say, well, here's the, here's the cost and the benefit, but they don't actually understand what the benefit is. And I'll give you the last example. 
Well, isn't it true also though, Todd, that that's the best case scenario, the uh, $300, yeah. you know? Yes. Yeah, so, <laughs> well, and yeah, and I could mean, the other thing is, is that you could get into how they calculated it. There's a way that they calculated it, and they calculated it using a very high number. Um, but even with that very high number, their own calculations are wildly off compared to what they claim. Now, if you want to be somebody in the city of Vancouver who pays more taxes so that other people around the world can benefit, that's your choice. But be honest about what, your, what the policy is and what it's doing, who pays and who benefits. And they just, I sincerely believe that the staff at Vancouver didn't even know um, what they were claiming. They just saw the number and just used it. But there's another example of this, which is, is that so we have Washington State has passed this very comprehensive, what's called cap and trade system that is going into effect next year that literally rations how much gasoline and CO2 can be emitted in Washington State, ratcheting down to basically zero by the year 2050. It has to be cut in half by 2030, which is really radical. So uh, the, the, the problem, there's lots of problems with that, but the, one of the benefits of it is what, now that you have that system, you don't have to do all these ad hoc things. You don't have to subsidize solar. You don't have to subsidize electric vehicles. You don't have to ban natural gas in, in homes because all of those things were a surrogate for the fact that we didn't have a strategy. Now we have a strategy. So we don't need to do those any things any, anymore. But of course, that doesn't stop politicians from doing all those things because all this, because spending other people's money to look good is fun. So what they're doing is that they're now, they're still doing all of those ad hoc things that should be you know, that, that don't make any difference now, that don't have any additional effect, they're still spending the money. So it doesn't make any sense to do that once you already have a policy. And the other part of it is, is that the governor says, well, even with this, we still won't meet our 2030 target because we, we need to find other ways to reduce it, uh, CO2 emissions in the state. So they proposed a bunch of policies this year, some of them which they passed spending. So I emailed the Department of Ecology and the governor's climate advisors. And I said, all right, you passed these things. How much did it reduce the gap compared to where we're gonna be and what we need to do? And neither of them responded. The ecology said, we haven't done the analysis. Well then, well, then why are you proposing the bill? If you don't know if it's actually gonna help meet the goal, because that was the justification for passing these things was we need to narrow this gap. And then you ask them, did it narrow the gap? And they're like, we don't know. We've never done the analysis. That's the problem is, is that nobody actually takes the time to look at or care, frankly, if the policies that they are advocating achieve the goal that they say is so critical. What's the disincentive there? Why is that not happening? If the reason, the impetus behind the passage and the popularity of you know, getting the bill enough support to go through is, hey, we need to narrow this gap. Um, why isn't there a corresponding demand to see if the gap was narrowed? One, because um, a lot of climate policy now is just a Trojan horse for special interest payoffs. Um, uh, we do a lot. I mean, like in the, uh, the bill, uh, the IRA, um, which I won't say its full name because its full name is nonsense. Um, but in the bill, it says for every dollar that is spent to increase CO or increase renewable energy, five dollars a five dollar subsidy for projects built with union labor. So if you believe that climate change is a crisis, is an existential crisis, why would you spend five times as much subsidizing unions as you do actually increasing um, climate action? You wouldn't. So that's part of it. The other thing is, if you could reduce the CO2 emissions effectively, you would do it under cap and trade. You would simply say, okay, these emissions are now covered by cap and trade. But what they've exempted are what are called energy intensive trade exposed industries, industries that will simply go out of business if we raise their energy costs, agriculture, right, which is in a, which is a price taker. So you're, you're disadvantaging um, Washington state growers against world markets who don't have to deal with all of these new taxes. So there's a reason that all of these people have, all these CO2 emissions have been exempted. The only way to meet the goal is to remove that exemption, to make it cover them. And if you do that, 
you actually do more harm than good because you just drive growers, manufacturers out of state. So what they do is that they then say, okay, let's ban electric vehicles by the year 2035. This actually does nothing to reduce CO2 emissions because we already have a strict cap on the amount of gasoline that can be sold in Washington state. It doesn't affect that cap. We're just going to do this and ban new electric or new gas powered vehicles in Washington state because it sounds good, even though it adds nothing. So that's what they do is, is that they do new cool sounding policies, even when they don't add anything. And, you know, how realistic is that they'll, is it that they'll reach that goal of either banning the cars or, or anything else? I mean, aren't they going to have to rescind that at some point? Because as you pointed out, I forget, how many, how many electric t- trucks did we sell last year in Washington <laughs> last, State? Last year, there were two, two electric <laughs> trucks sold in Washington State. Yeah. Um, and so you're going to have to increase that pretty radically. Now, uh, there's the Rivian, um, which is a new electric truck. It's a new company that does electric trucks. The Ford F-150 is, is all electric. So we'll see how many are purchased. Um, uh, about 8% of new vehicles right now in Washington state are electric. So we have a long way to go from eight to a hundred percent. Um, I, I don't know. I mean, 13 years is a long time. Um, uh, so technology could improve, um, or something else could replace it. What's interesting is, is that I went back and looked at governor Inslee's book, um, that he released about 13 years ago. Um, and what he thought the future of transportation would be. And he thought it would be biofuels. He said, electric vehicles are a long way off. Biofuels is really where it is. So um, I don't know that I should make the same mistake Governor Inslee did in in making some sort of prediction about where we're going to be 13 years from now and be wildly wrong. Um, So I think it's very hard to judge, which which I think is an underlying problem with the policy itself is that it assumes that we know where we're going to be 13 years from now when we really know. Uh, next question from Tom. Does uh, state's carbon reduction include the carbon footprint of the mining, processing, manufacturing, delivery of renewable energy facilities? Yeah, no, it doesn't. Um, so <clears throat> what you're talking about is what's called the life cycle analysis um, of products, which includes it you know, basically from the very beginning all the way through to the end. Um, that is not, it is just emissions um, in Washington state. Um, so yeah, I'm trying to, I'm trying to think if there is a way that some of that embedded energy is included, but it really isn't. It's really direct emissions from Washington state. Next question. Isn't banning new gasoline car sales in Washington great for auto dealers in Idaho? (laughs) Yeah, it, it will be eventually, right? I mean, you yeah. know, a, a decade from now, uh, the the restriction ramps up slowly at the very beginning and then ramps up more aggressively later. Um, but uh, what the Washington state says is that they won't register any new gas powered vehicles. So if you buy, uh, if you go across the border and buy a new gas powered vehicle and bring it into Washington, they what they're threatening is that they won't even register it. I'm wondering how, what the workaround there is because people are going to come. I mean, there's so many people that move into the, the state. You know, they're going to be driving gas cars. You're just going to say, oh, "I'm sorry, you're you're a, you can't have transportation." Especially to people, military families, and others who say, let, "Let's say you can't afford a, a eighty thousand dollar electric truck." You know, um, you know, and I, I would put myself in that category. It's <laughs> it's, it's a problem. Uh, you also had a blog, Todd, about California's energy problems uh, costing us here in Washington. Why don't you describe, you know, what California's energy problems are and why it's going to impact us here? Well, California has been the poster child for going to green energy. Um, they even um, were going to close down Diablo Canyon nuclear, uh, which is about 8% of their electricity. Um, and go heavy on wind and solar. They've already gone very heavy on wind and solar, and they're starting to invest in batteries um, because obviously solar is only good for a very short period of the day, and then you need to store that energy somehow. Um, and what's interesting is, is that peak demand um, is 6 and 7 p.m., and if you look at the curve, solar starts to collapse <laughs> as the, you know, the sun goes down, 
right as peak demand goes up. And so there's a big mismatch between when solar is available and when electricity um, is at its peak demand. And so what fills in that gap is natural gas primarily, um, some nuclear, but it's hard to ramp up nuclear, um, and then a lot of energy from out of state, particularly from Washington state. We are one of the biggest places that California gets energy when they need it during uh, peak hours. So the effect of their energy sh uh, shortages are that we're on the same grid that they are. So if you look for day ahead demand, so if a utility says, you know what, we have about 90% of the energy we need for tomorrow, but we need a little bit more. We're going to buy on the day ahead market than what we need. Well, those prices now go through the roof. Um, and so what you're seeing typically is that, you know, $50 a megawatt hour, all of a sudden it goes to $2,000 a megawatt hour. Um, and that's, you know, only for a few hours. But, you know, if you're paying 40 times as much as you normally would for electricity, you know, one hour um, can, you know, be as much as you spend in two days um, as a utility. And so it, those peak hours and the shortages that we have on the day ahead market, the ability to purchase on the day ahead market can really have a big impact on total electricity bills and how utilities have to, what they have to charge their customers. How does Washington avoid this problem? I mean, if Cal we can't control what California does, right. it's an open market. So they're going to continue to buy, you know, the electricity here. Um, you know, how do we put us, I'm just trying to think of with all the inflationary pressures and other things, you know, and property taxes going through the absolute roof here. Don't get me started on that. I'm ticked off um, <laughs> <laughs> in Pierce, Pierce County, Tacoma area. Um, you know, how, what can we do to negate that pot potentially, you know, significant and crippling increase in cost? So we can't negate it. We're on the same grid and it's good that we're on the same grid because trade is good, right? They use more electricity in the summer, our peak demand typically is in the winter when, when their winters are very mild. So it's good to have this trade back and forth. Um, the other thing is, is that when we sell surplus energy at a very high cost to California, um, we get, you know, there's jobs here and money that comes here uh, from California. So there's some economic benefit there as well. But what you have to do is you can't plan state by state. You know, a lot of our energy policies are we're going to be 100% renewable by 2030, and then we're going to have enough energy, you know, by 2045 to do it ourselves. Um, you can't, you know, you have to build in flexibility. You have to recognize that what happens in California is going to affect you, and you can't ignore that. Um, so I think that's the key. And obviously, I mean, you know, it's sort of the issue du jour and I bring it up constantly, but it just makes no sense to tear down 8% of the electricity that is in Washington state. You know, you make yourself, you make your electrical grid more fragile and more susceptible to what happens in California if you destroy the Snake River dams um, and you're not keeping up. Um, the other thing is, is that I saw um, the governor's climate advisor talking about, do we have enough electricity for all of these new electric vehicles? And she said, oh yes, we've got 40 new solar projects. Well, again, solar is abundant. We already have lots of energy. California has lots of energy during the middle of the day when there's solar. Putting more energy into that narrow time frame rather than when it's needed um, at peak hours um, just creates a glut. And then the collapses and then you have to, you know, have it at uh, peak demand. So you have to think about where the electricity is available in other states and simply, you know, fire hosing more electricity when it's abundant um, and not when it is needed um, makes you susceptible to California's and energy problems. Yeah, I mean, the tough part about the Snake River dams is I, I feel like, and maybe I'm wrong, because, you know, some of the newspapers on the West Side, they, they, they cover it. But I think there's a lot of people on the West Side who kind of think of the Snake River dams as an Eastern Washington thing. You know what I mean? Like, well, that, that's over there, and they're not really, really putting those pieces together. Hey, it's 8% of the grid here. We're all on the same grid. There's going to be a problem. And, um, 
you know, and then we've got opponents that are able to, well, I mean, the governor and others, have, they, they shop reports around. There's been report after report after report from, from the scientific authority saying it doesn't make sense to remove these dams. And yet, you know, we just heard from Senator Patty Murray and, and, uh, and Governor Inslee with their, uh, their report that, you know, oh, lo and behold, we, we, we have this report now that says the dam should go out. You already covered that. We, we did that on the show here about how that data was manipulated and wrong and, and ridiculous. Um, but it still happens and it still got them headlines, you know, and, and there are some, you know, there's some media uh, uh, places that, that latch onto that despite the evidence. So, you know, that, that's, that's going to be an ongoing problem here, I, the way I see it. Yeah, yeah and, and just to put the sort of the cherry on top of that, the most recent report didn't look at whether it was a good idea to tear down the dams. It simply assumed it was. Yeah. And said, okay, how do we make that happen? <laughs> I, I forgot about that. Yeah, they, they gave up on trying to get a report to say Correct. it's a good idea. This time they said, all right, tell us, what was it? Tell us the benefits of getting rid of these dams. You know, right. so it cha changes the, the point. Yeah, it's, that's crazy. Well, Todd, thanks so much for being on. Um, you know, one of the things about Washington Policy on the go is uh, we're just going now until, until we're done. That gives you a chance to enjoy the rest of your lunch. We're not going to just fill up the whole hour unless we've got the whole hour of, of content for you. And we want to make sure that uh, you're able to, we respect your time and we're able to uh, get you on the go uh, with the policy information you need. So thanks a lot, Todd. Appreciate it. And thanks to all of you for signing on. And uh, don't forget the video of this will be available on our YouTube channel uh, for Washington Policy Center. Thanks so much for jo joining us. Watch for a special edition of Washington Policy on the go next week, next Tuesday. And again, thanks for tuning in.